Thank you. Um, first, uh, let, let me uh, begin, <coughs> begin by um, an, an apology, which is I wasn't actually supposed to be here. Uh, originally, um, Maggie McMillan uh, was supposed to be on this panel and, and present a paper, and, and she was unable to make it. And um, uh, taking advantage of the fact that I was uh, sort of in the neighborhood by my usual standards. I've been spending a couple of months in, at, at Oxford. Um, she asked me if I could do this, so um, I, I said I'd be happy. Uh, once I looked at, at the program, it looked um, uh, uh, really fascinating. In fact, um, we just heard uh, uh, two very um, good uh, presentations um, that, uh, in, in, in comparison, uh, mine is going to uh, be extremely incoherent uh, because, uh, first, it's not based on a paper. Second, I'm trying to bring in ideas from uh, three different um, lines of research that uh, I've been engaged in. And um, I'm going to try to make uh, all of this as much rel as relevant as possible to, to what you've already heard. Um, and, then, and, then, and then we can discuss. So briefly, um, what I'm going to be talking about is, is a little bit about the, um, the economics um, of uh, manufacturing and convergence. Um, uh, then talk a little bit about uh, institutions and issues of institutional design and the architecture of state business relations. Here there'll be, you'll see lots of parallels with, with, um, and complementarities what uh, we've just heard. Uh, and then uh, um, I'll just put on my amateur uh, political scientist hat and, and make a couple of comments about the politics of uh, industrial policy. Uh, so let me start uh, first with the, with the economics um, of, of manufacturing and, and the role that manufacturing plays in economic growth and, and convergence. Um, one big question here is, is why is, in fact, why is manufacturing special and, and different? Um, uh, one window on uh, the role that manufacturing plays uh, in economic growth uh, comes from, uh, from, from uh, these results uh, on, the, on the, uh, 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 the prevailing tendency of um, uh, unconditional convergence uh, in manufacturing around the world in terms of labor productivity. Uh, so the, the, the striking result here is that uh, uh, once these manufacturing industries get, get established, there is an almost automatic tendency for uh, convergence towards the, in the, to, in, towards the uh, uh, productivity frontier, uh, regardless of basically at the, of, of the level of disaggregation that, that you're looking at. These pictures are um, two-digit uh, manufacturing industries. Uh, so the, the sample, uh, the panel on the left is really the full sample, um, covers 118 countries. Each dot here is a two-digit um, uh, m manufacturing industry in one country. Uh, and the striking thing here is that when you look at this picture, I'm actually not controlling uh, for any country-specific features um, uh, because we normally think that convergence is highly conditional, depends on country characteristics, <laughs> whether you've got your human capital right, whether you've got your institutions right, whether you've got your policies right, whether you've got your macro stability. Uh, but when you look at manufacturing, uh, it turns out that, that regardless of that, as even if you don't control for country-level characteristics, uh, once, once these industries are, are, have been set up, uh, they tend to converge in labor productivity terms. And you can see this from the ne negative slope, uh, which is that um, the, the lower the initial base of labor productivity, um, the, the more rapid uh, the subsequent rate of growth of labor productivity over the next decade. Uh, now, before I, 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 I knew that this was also true for Africa, but uh, b before I came here, I, I wanted to check again. Um, so this, the, the right panel is what you see is the same sample, but now restricted to just the, um, uh, the African, uh, sub-Saharan African countries. There's about 20 um, sub-Saharan African countries here, uh, and the relationship is, if anything, um, at least the, the slope is, is, is steeper. Uh, in the sub-Saharan African case. Again, it's the same thing that, that you know, there's, there's, um, every country uh, enters multiple times because of, of different two-digit industries. Now, there is a selection, there's an issue here in terms of how to interpret this, uh, because uh, the sample here in most cases are 
are already registered uh, formal firms. So you don't want to think about this manufacturing as a whole. You really want to think about it as, as organized manufacturing industries. In most of these African countries, the sample covers uh, firms uh, that with 10, at least 10 employees. Uh, so maybe not sort of the medium fir the medium sized uh, firms that, that John Sutton was talking about, somewhat smaller firms as well. Uh, but the, the striking thing is that, that, uh, that there is this, this pattern. Uh, as I said, this um, also, uh, you can observe this at various levels of, of um, uh, uh, disaggregation. I won't go to the four digit, which is, um, it looks very similar. But even if you aggregate at the level of manufacturing, uh, you get the same, uh, which is, uh, so this is now, each observation is aggregate manufacturing in different countries and for the sub-Saharan African uh, sample. Uh, pretty much, uh, you know, uh, a, a negative relationship. Uh, of course, it's, it's, it's only in the latter case, about 21 countries, including South Africa, uh, so it's a much smaller sample. So, it's, again, to emphasize this, it doesn't mean, uh, to emphasize what this means, it doesn't mean that uh, policies don't matter. It doesn't mean that if you don't have appropriate macroeconomic for frameworks, you don't have uh, good human capital and, and, and governance, that in fact uh, the uh, productivity uh, increase in your manufacturing sector will be even higher. But the striking thing here is that you actually don't need that, that there is some inherent dynamic in manufacturing, or at least, again, organized manufacturing that puts you on this escalator. So that's the sense in which organized manufacturing um, uh, uh, seems to be the escalator part of the economy, where if you just basically get these industries up and going, uh, that there is an inherent dynamic that's going to push you towards the uh, productivity frontier. Now, um, if manufacturing uh, exhibits uh, such convergence, the question is why doesn't it not aggregate to the economy as a whole? Why doesn't it carry over to the entire economy? Um, and uh, here, I think we, give it, we begin to get a, a bit of a glimpse as to sort of um, how, in fact, um, uh, successful countries <coughs> differ from unsuccessful countries, because it is not, by and large, in terms of the internal dynamics of how well their manufacturing has done in terms of productivity, but, in fact, in terms of how successful they have been in increasing the size of their <coughs> manufacturing industries. That is increasing the number of firms, increasing the number of, of uh, or the size of the existing firms um, uh, in, these, um, uh, in these escalator industries. So if you just want to uh, think about how this would um, aggregate over to the entire economy, think about the economy being made up of um, sort of the modern sector, this manufacturing part of the economy, which exhibits this escalator, unconditional convergence behavior, and then think about the rest, think about the, 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 um, the traditional part or the, um, uh, what I've called here the, the non-manufacturing, but you may want to think about the, the, the rest of the economy that doesn't exhibit this uh, convergence behavior. And then if you ask, um, how will, how does aggregate growth um, uh, uh, gets determined? Well, aggregate growth gets the benefit of this convergence property, where beta is the convergence rate. Um, but the problem is, is that the part of the economy which is exhibiting this convergence is actually very, very small. It's the manufacturing, and that's alpha. Uh, so in, a, in an African country, this might be 5%, no more. Uh, so even though part of the economy is getting this convergence kick, uh, it's not really carrying over um, at, in the large to the economy simply because the part of it that gets this escalator treatment is such a tiny part. And actually a big dis differentiator across countries is really going to be whether, in fact, um, resources are moving in the right direction. That is, the, con the converging parts of the economy, the manufacturing or, or, or escalator parts of the industry, are expanding because given there's going to be a large differential, productivity differential, given this convergence behavior between manufacturing and non-manufacturing, you're going to get a large kick uh, out of this. And that's, to some extent, uh, the key difference. The key difference here in terms of reallocation of, of resources, the movement into manufacturing, uh, again, something that, uh, that, that John Sutton uh, emphasized this morning, uh, is, is a key dynamic. And now that can happen both because individual firms, existing firms are growing, 
And in successful countries, they're going to be growing much faster uh, than in non-successful countries, or because you get uh, entry. More firms enter the registered, um, uh, uh, organized parts of the economy. Uh, but the, the emphasis that, that this framework um, uh, generates in terms of if industrial policy and state business relations uh, is going to be an emphasis that says, well, perhaps uh, you have to pay a little bit less attention to the productivity dynamic of existing firms, uh, a little bit more attention to whether, in fact, they're growing. Uh, because those are two different things. Uh, the productivity dynamic seems to be there, seems to be an inherent productivity dynamic there, uh, but what's really big difference across countries is in fact whether those uh, escalator industries are able to draw resources from the rest of the economy, they're, whether they're able to expand or not. So that provides an appropriate uh, and important focus for state business relations and industrial policy, enterprise policy, whatever you want to call it, is simply to figure out what is preventing these firms from growing or what is preventing new firms from entering into these sectors uh, as opposed to what things that we might think of in the advanced country um, uh, context as productivity policies or R&D policies and other things uh, that are converse that, that, that focus on, on, on this term. Um, so uh, let me now, now move on to um, sort of this, the, this, the second uh, institutional part of my presentation, the, the, the state business relations. So here's a triangle that actually sort of looks a little bit like, um, uh, like, like the one that, that Lindsay uh, showed you. In fact, there's going to be lots of parallel. I like to distinguish when thinking about the uh, architectural design of industrial policies as essentially thinking about the separate roles of uh, the state and business. But let's not forget that there's a society out there um, and, and one of the things that, that um, I think one of the problems of industrial policy in the East Asian context uh, is that the state business relations have been very, uh, working very well, thank you. Uh, but uh, um, uh, there is some problem in terms of to what extent that actually serves um, society's um, um, well-being um, and to what extent it's actually accountable to society. So uh, the, the first um, element uh, which um, uh, John already uh, mentioned is, is the notion of embeddedness. And the notion of embeddedness comes from the fact that uh, really the government doesn't have enough information uh, about where the obstacles are, where the opportunities are, um, sort of where do you, you know, again, uh, where, which wheels are broken, uh, again, to use John Sutton's term. Uh, and, and that information is going to be diffused widely in society uh, within, uh, across, across firms. And so, um, uh, the, the state or the bureaucracy has got to be embedded uh, in society so that there are mechanisms through which that information can be elicited. So in that setting, actually, this, the traditional way in which economists think about uh, regulation, which is a, in terms of principal agent models, is, is very, very, I think is, is the wrong way of thinking about uh, the way that bureaucracy ought to relate to business in this context, because the, uh, the principal agent model begins by assuming that the state actually, or the bureaucrats, or the regulator knows uh, what it wants to maximize, uh, what it wants to optimize, what's the welfare function, or what the, what the uh, maximand is. A lot of this is actually trying to figure out what is it that you're trying to do. Uh, so in that sense, uh, this embeddedness is, is very important. The, in, the notion, the, the term embeddedness, I think, was first used by Peter Evans. And it's interesting that, um, that he used this. Uh, in the context of the, the East Asian um, countries like South Korea, where he said, yes, the state in South Korea has been autonomous. That's sort of been the traditional focus of why is it that South Korea had been successful in industrial policy. But he said autonomy isn't enough. It's also that it has been an embedded kind of an autonomy so that the bureaucrats, the state, were actually able to, uh, on an ongoing basis, elicit information uh, from, uh, from, uh, from, from business. Now, uh, John's discussion of, of presidential councils, advisory councils, was very interesting because it is a deliberate attempt at creating uh, some kind of embeddedness, uh, but also suggests that, that it's, you know, embeddedness isn't something that you can, you can have only at the highest level. So, uh, so it's interesting that one of the findings is, as, as John stated, is, is that uh, these presidential councils weren't very good about identifying obstacles. Did I get that right? Or, 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 
And that's exactly how you, what you would expect because they're so high level. You have you know, these 15 large firms. And what is it that those large 15 firms can agree on? Uh, you know, they can probably agree on taxes are too high and, and there's too much red tape. Um, and so they can all agree on that, but there's going to be very little else that they're going to agree on. Whereas in fact, the real obstacles, the real problems are going to be much more, much more deeply uh, in, in, um, uh, in, uh, in, in sort of at a, at a much more fine-grained level. So in some sense, this embeddedness really has to, has to run through um, uh, uh, deeper layers of, layers of society. Now, of course, I, I want to repeat what Lindsay said, which is that you, you, cannot, be, you cannot expect everything. Uh, that these, these structures aren't going to be identical, uh, but you can rely on uh, those pa pockets of bureaucratic efficiency or some of the more um, uh, capable institutions to, um, to, to perform that function as well as you can, uh, which is, of course, another reason why you don't want to be too orthodox about the instruments of industrial policy because the appropriate in instruments may often depend on which agency actually has the capacity. Uh, so in what you may want to do through credit instruments in one country uh, may better be done through tax instruments in another, uh, simply because of the differential capacity of different um, uh, agencies. Uh, the second is, is really sort of discipline. Uh, of course, you know, I need to say probably the least about this because obviously you know, what you want, the state, you want to be embedded in business, but you don't want to be in bed with business. Um, and, and so I think that so the component of, of discipline, which is that you need to provide the stick as well as the carrot, and that is really ultimately going to rely on formulating clear objectives, having measurable targets, uh, a degree of monitoring, evaluation, and program review. Um, so I think these are, these are some of the obvious elements uh, that go in there. And, and third, um, the, uh, the, the, the issue of accountability, uh, because ultimately, uh, you know, this is, industrial policy is not about a, a nice, cozy working relationship between bureaucrats and business. It's really about serving society's well-being. And so you will need mechanisms of accountability here. Now, when you look at East Asia, it's actually quite interesting uh, about the lack of accountability. I mean, in Singapore, there's absolutely no accountability of industrial policy. You have all these bureaucrats deciding on the fates of industries and firms uh, behind completely closed doors. And nobody really knows actually what they're doing and why they're doing it, except that they're very good at what they do. Um, and part of what that uh, is perhaps that in Singapore that they're actually very, very well paid. Um, and, and, uh, and, and you can afford to, to, um, to hire them. Uh, in China, I think, you know, probably, you know, sort of there's obviously a lot of corruption that goes on. But by and large, it served positive ends. And you, you might say that it's been because of, of uh, competition across provinces and, and, and municipalities um, that has keep, kept bureaucrats uh, relatively, uh, relatively honest. So in, in, the, in, the, in the three minutes or so that, that remains, I want to just turn to my, to my last um, idea, uh, last topic, which is, uh, okay, I mean, so how do you get this thing? What, what is the politics that's going to actually allow you to set up uh, such designs. Um, and here, uh, I just want to complement what uh, Lindsay has said uh, in terms of the importance of uh, political settlements, uh, social contracts, contrasts, contracts, uh, you know, what um, uh, uh, Ajamola and Robinson uh, often talk about in terms of critical junctures, these periods when you have sort of this realignment of interests that, that enable a new bargain. Uh, to be enunciated um, to, that creates the context and environment in which you can get these, these positive institutional changes going forward. Um, now, what I, the, 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 the main contribution I want to make to that discussion is simply emphasize something that is, uh, you know, uh, that is uh, very attractive to an academic, uh, but I think is also true, which is the, the power of ideas. Um, and we often think about sort of when, and, and I think there's a tendency in the political science literature, but also in the sort of, you know, economics, political economy literature, to think about sort of how these conditions come about in too much power and vested interests terms. That is that you need to get the constellation of power and vested interests just right uh, that you can set up these, these, uh, uh, these institutions. I would like to say that in fact, uh, that 
these outcomes are are, are relatively under uh, uh, are, are, are are underdetermined uh, by by interest, uh, because oftentimes uh, you can you're you're able to tell stories or narratives about what states have got to do uh, that are compatible with um, the same constellation of power and interest, but can take you in very many different directions. Uh, so, uh, you know, think about sort of two different objectives uh, which the elites have. You know, it could be that they want to enrich themselves, or you can be that, that they're actually sort of bureaucratically minded or state elites, that they want to aggrandize the power of the state uh, for foreign policy or military reasons. Well, you say, you know, how am I going to best pursue that end? Well, you can tell yourself a story that the way to do it is by repress markets, you know, concentrate all the power in your hands, or you can tell a story that, in fact, you're going to do that by expanding the markets, by globalizing in a controlled kind of way, ex ante, whether, in fact, this enriches you more or that enriches you more, I would argue is not, perf is not fully determined by the initial constellation of, of interests or power. And I think the same argument would go about the aggrandizement of the state. You know, often we talk about you know, the South Koreans or the Taiwanese have, having turned towards that growth-promoting industrial policies because they felt this, this external threat. And they reacted to that external threat by saying, we better be you know, uh, um, uh, manufacturing or, or, or export superpowers so we can stand up to that. Well, you know, many countries in the Middle East, Egypt, for example, responded to the appearance of a similar external threat from Israel in a very different manner uh, by, in fact, building up uh, an inward-oriented uh, uh, military-industrial complex with, with very different, uh, with very different um, uh, uh, consequences. So what I want to really emphasize here is that there's a role for uh, framing. There is a role for ideas. There's a role for narratives uh, about how, what... Um, you can achieve uh, without necessarily powerful people losing their power, but simply reinterpreting, in fact, what their interests are. So let me stop.